Abuju, Tanse, Songi Benisi, and the Natish Nakaski Lutotem, Winnipeg and Dojanib, Pagrawagan Cree Nation and Dojanib. Uh, I just want to wish everybody a happy National Truth and Reconciliation Day, Orange Shirt Day. Um, this one's always a really tough one for me, you know. I'm uh, I'm always really uh, emotional on this day, and I, I, I tend to avoid going to um, all the marches and stuff and just the different things that are going on. And... Um, you know, my sons, they, they, they're they with their mother today. They're going to a flea market to buy some stuff with their mother and uh, and her mother, which I'm really pleased about. And um, But to everybody who's out there marching and hitting the streets today, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm with you there in spirit. But yeah, just lit a smudge and... Uh, yeah, and I burnt some tobacco to pray for all the Indian residential school survivors, the ones that are still out there raising families, you know, running the economy, um, and teaching our young people about the history of these lands they call Canada. And um, the one thing I wanted to do today in honor of uh, Orange Shirt Day or uh, National Truth and Reconciliation Day is I wanted to share a letter that I wrote to my dad, Peter Sinclair Sr. Um, you know, he passed away. Uh, um, he drank himself to death, actually. And, uh, you know, he passed away from cirrhosis when he was 58. And, uh, yeah, I miss him a lot. I didn't really, you know, I didn't get to grow up with him, but... You know, we became buddies once I became an adult. And, uh, yeah, this, uh, he was an Indian residential school survivor. And so, uh, yeah, I wanted to share this letter with, with all of you. <laughs> Dear Dad, I remember walking down towards the lake shore in our family's ancestral homeland on the reservation of Pugatawagan. My mom was taking me to go and visit you. I still remember the huge Doberman Pinscher you lived with. That dog did not like my mom very much, but I remember her liking me. It was almost as if she could see that I was your son. While visiting you, I remember I spent most of my time playing with the Doberman. She was very obedient and would jump at the snap of my finger five feet into the air. That was pretty cool. I don't remember the conversation I had with you that day on the shore of the Churchill River in Pugatawagan, but I sure do remember how much I bonded with that dog. And I remember when you told me, that dog is your dog. Look at the way it responds to you. Later in life, I was sitting in the Sundance Lodge, and the man sitting next to me was my brother. <clears throat> Arlen told me that my Doberman had terrorized him every day as a child when he would walk to school. I guess my Doberman was actually a quite a mean and infamous dog on the reserve. And she would bark at all the children viciously as they walked by your property. I only got to meet my Doberman that one time because somebody gave the dog poisoned meat and killed her. So the next time I went to Pugatawagan, she wasn't there. <clears throat> the first time I met you, Dad, I barely remember it. I was four or five years old and walking down a, a, a back lane in Brandon, Manitoba, across the street from the University of Brandon. There was a big sedan parked in my auntie's driveway. And in the car was you, wearing a suit jacket with your jet black hair. You looked at me and it was like I was looking in a mirror. Instantly, my little tummy said to me exactly who you were. You asked me, hey boy, do you know who I am? 
And I responded back and I said, yes, you're my father. And the other memory I have of that moment was your missing finger on your left hand. I can count the times that I met you before your journey on both of my hands. The last time I saw you alive was at the Grace Hospital. That was when your liver had quit from drinking so much. Do you remember me looking into your eyes that day? I often wonder if you could feel the overwhelming sadness I was grappling with. I felt completely powerless. I knew you were getting ready to make your journey. I remember when you looked into my eyes and told me that I was always so darn serious and that the only thing I needed to focus on in this life was making money so that I could leave something behind for my children when I die. It was crushing. Your impact on the world, Dad, was undeniable. Everywhere I went, people would tell me how special of a person you were and how much you impacted them. Others would tell me how horrible you were as a womanizer and as a drunk. And through it all, I always felt proud I was your son and that I had your looks. Though sometimes people in power who had done, who you had done wrong punished me because they weren't able to get to you and they could see clear as day, I was your boy. I was grateful for those few times I had spent with you when I was a child. One time at the St. Regis Hotel, the old Indian Embassy in downtown Winnipeg, I saw you. I knew that was the spot you would stay when you came to the city from up north. I knew it was the place you would hang out and catch up with your chums and drink your problems away. It was at the St. Regis you shared with me your story about losing your virginity to a nun during your time at residential school. I wasn't sure how to take this information, but I thought about it through the years to this day, juxtaposing this horrendous experience you shared with me against the many stories of residential school that my mother Gail shared with me. And I knew there must be a lot more that you kept deep inside. Maybe that's why you drank so heavily and died so young. All of your other sons have shared with me the moment they ended up fighting you physically because of your nasty behavior when you drank. You would often say some of the meanest things and when you would talk about my mother in despicable ways, I would just leave. I swore in my heart and my spirit that I would never fight my father who brought me here into this world. Years later, I was driving with my mother down McPhillips towards Notre Dame. I had brought up the 215 kids that they discovered at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Like the rest of Indigenous peoples in Canada, I was awash in mixed emotions, trauma being one of them. I shared this with my mom. That day they had announced that they had discovered hundreds more unmarked graves of Indian residential school students in Brandon, Manitoba. Mom says to me ever so casually, oh yeah, that's where your dad went to residential school. She never told me before what school you had attended and neither did you. As a child living in Brandon, I still remember going to the current park swimming pool and having to drive by that damn residential school every time. I would always look up on the hill and think to myself, man, that place is haunted for sure. And since that day, my mom shared with me where you went to school, I've thought about the fact that many of those kids were probably friends of yours. They probably faced similar forms of sexual, physical, emotional, and spiritual abuse by the administrators of that institution. I thought maybe one of them was your best friend and you just never saw them again. I've been feeling sad trying to find resolution about this. During the last election here in Canada, the number of unmarked graves had reached thousands 
indigenous children finally able to return home. I've been thinking about you sitting there in the good hunting grounds. It made me feel really happy that you were there with your rugged Cree humor to welcome your friend's spirits home. Maybe your best friend was one of them. Maybe it was a happy reunion. So, so many people I, I, I talked to had their families directly touched by this event, the Kamloops 2015 and all of the thousands of unmarked graves that they're still discovering today. So many stories of children who went away and just never returned. Mothers, fathers, and grandparents were desperately trying to find them, eventually only to give up and fall into negative patterns of alcoholism or other forms of dependency to try and kill the pain and forget. Maybe you didn't die at resident, maybe you didn't die when you went to residential school because it was your destiny to create my siblings and I to carry on the responsibilities that you were born with. <coughs> you are given special gifts in your life that perhaps due to trauma, you just weren't able to. I want you to know that I'm doing my best to try and talk about difficult subjects like growing up without you in my life. When you were alive, the one time I asked you for help as a young man, you told me, I'm not going to give you any money, but if you want to work, I can get you to work. Little did I know the job was running a drug house for my brothers who were co-founders <clears throat> of the Manitoba Warriors. It's a pretty crazy hand of cards that many others and myself have survived being raised by Indian residential school students. <coughs> like you, Dad, I've been a really shitty husband to my son's mother, Corinne. I want you to know that I've been a great father to my sons, Felix and Jackson. They're happy and flourishing in their culture, education, and most importantly, unconditional love from their mother, Corinne and I. I think about you sitting there in the good hunting grounds, your skin and eyes no longer yellow with jaundice, your jet black hair and braids, I think maybe you're doing a ceremony and eating off the land with other spirits who finally get to sit with Creator now that their unmarked graves have been unearthed, now that they get to go home. I want you and all the other children in the spirit world that attended residential schools to know that there are many of us men working hard to undo what has been done to our fathers. I want you to know that I love you and all of our people unconditionally. And I forgive you for the hurt, the violence and trauma you passed on to me and others. I felt an emptiness inside my chest my whole life trying to communicate with you, Dad. I have been trying to let you know I don't judge you. I love you. I hope you can hear me. I'm a good father and hopefully one day a good grandfather. Anyway, I want to encourage you all to, uh, you know, go easy on yourself and, uh, you know, If you don't do it often, you know, try it out. But the art or the act of prayer and and um, surrendering to no ta way, to kijimene do, it can really help you a lot, you know. I've, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've certainly come to realize that in my life. And so everybody have a good National Truth and Reconciliation Day and make sure and love your family. Take care of your hearts. 
Because no matter how sick your body gets, if your heart is protected and strong, your body will continue to live just like those salmon. <laughs> you go see. We'll see you all out in the streets and out on the land.